Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're speaking with Melanie Greenberg, who is a psychologist, author, speaker, and coach with more than 20 years experience. Today, we're discussing her book, The Stress-Proof Brain, Master Your Emotional Response to Stress Using Mindfulness and Neuroplasticity. Welcome to the show, Melanie. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm happy to be here. So what inspired you to write this book? Well, I grew up in South Africa um, in the 60s and 70s, and we, I learned a very healthy approach to life in a certain way. It was like closeness to nature, you know, more slow pace, uh, more connection, connection with family, you know, doing yoga, eating bean sprouts. And then in around 1986, um, there was apartheid was at its peak. And there were a lot of changes in the society and a lot of my friends started leaving and this is turbulence and this kind of violence. And so I had this sort of healthy, peaceful approach to life. And then I realized that things change and that you have to learn to deal with changes in your life. And I found this book called The Wisdom of Insecurity by Alan Watts. And the general idea that, that really came home to me was that you can't expect things to stay the same, that you have to learn how to be resilient, how to adapt and flow with change. And so that became a philosophy of mine. And as I started my life in the U.S. and went through different stages in my career and my work, I decided to to put that into a book, which kind of combined the healthy, holistic view with the idea that you need to find ways to adapt to change. Well, you know, that's something that um, most people don't talk about. I mean, we don't like change. We want to keep everything the same. It's more comfortable. Um, We're all very resistant to change. So, um, it you know, it's good to to bring that awareness to people. Yeah, that's what I thought as well, because I was certainly resistant and and scared and anxious. and, And so finding this philosophy of mindfulness, of not of realizing that you can adapt and that you don't have to cling to things being a certain way. It's really helped me a lot in, in many different ways in my life. And I did want to share that with clients and then with, the, with my audience for my book. So what exactly is stress? So stress is a mind body phenomenon. It is when you face a threat or you face a potential loss of something uh, or things change and you don't have the skills to deal with the new situation, that you have to experience a feeling in your body to uh, where you go into a fight, flight or freeze state and your body gets all alerted you know, to, to try to deal with whatever's coming at it. So in your book, you you talk about acute versus chronic stress. And I think most people think of stress of, you know, that was a stressful day or a stressful situation. And it's pretty rare of us to think about, you know, chronic stress. So what's that? So acute stress is some specific challenge that you take on. Like maybe you run a marathon or you write an exam. You rev yourself up and... And then it's over and you can kind of relax, you know, and going back, go back to restful state. But what happens in our society is that a lot of stresses are not so easily resolvable. They kind of hang around without resolution or with uncertainty. So an example might be you lose your job and you, you're looking for another job or you have financial stress or you're having a difficult relationship. And what happens is that your body can end up staying in that, in that alert fight flight state where you have stress hormones like cortisol. And it's like your body's always in a state of, of vigilance. It's always in a state of like preparing for a threat. 
And while that's health, that can be fine in the short term or healthy even, in the long term, it can create wear and tear on your body and create inflammation. And that can be dangerous to your health or risky for your health potentially. So what, what, what would that look like if we have chronic health, uh, sorry, chronic stress, what health um, problems would arise? So there's a lot of problems related to dysregulation of all kinds of systems in your body. Um, so inflammation is basically to do with your immune system. And cortisol is a hormone that gets released when we're under stress. When cortisol sticks around for too long, it starts affecting the immune system and the immune system becomes insensitive. And so inflammation is, is what we do when we're trying to fight off a disease. We, we release these cells you know, to fight off the bacteria. But with lots of cortisol, the inflammation can become chronic and then that can cause heart disease, diabetes, excess belly fat, and even cancer sometimes. And it can also affect brain aging, allergies, asthma, autoimmune diseases. So there's this whole host of diseases as well as, as mental health issues like depression and anxiety. All of those can potentially be a result of chronic stress that isn't properly managed. So um, how... How can we recognize that we're under chronic stress? I, I think a lot of people will kind of go, go, go through life and not realize that this is something that's happening. So how can we recognize that there is that going on in our body? So chronic stress is not just having a lot to do, you know, or having a, a, a demanding job or being, you know, a mom with with three kids and a job. I mean, that, that's not necessarily chronic stress. It, it's more about how you perceive it. So, it so, so for some people, that can be very stressful, you know, like not having so much to do, not enough time. For other people, it's not necessarily that stressful because it's meaningful and they have systems. Um, so a lot of it is, it is it's individual and it's how you perceive the stress. But some warning signs of chronic stress might be when you start feeling burnt out or exhausted, you lack energy, or you kind of, you're wired and, and hyper and worried all the time and you can't sleep, or you start doing things like comfort eating or drinking too much or, you know, zoning out on the couch watching TV and, and you can't get moving and motivated or you're irritable. Those might be, all be indicators of chronic stress. So what makes us not able to to deal with stress? What makes us go to those things like the chronic eating or the zoning out? So often it's to do with the nature of the stress. And then it's, I think it's also to do with your coping skills. So again, I think we, when stresses are uncontrollable and when, you know, we, we have a potential to, to lose something or the problem just seems very difficult to solve, like maybe somebody has a lot of debt. Um, eventually, I think, you know, you kind of, people get worn out if they try a bunch of things and they don't work, and that can make you vulnerable to chronic stress. But also it depends on your coping skills. You know, some people have stress management routines, like if you do regular exercise, and you get fresh air, and you eat healthy, and you know, you, you socialize with friends. Some of those can be buffers against stress that kind of, you know, that feed you and nurture you. And it's also how you treat yourself, whether you're self-critical or whether you can actually be compassionate to yourself and listen to your body, things like that. So um, in your book, you talk about the, the amygdala. What, what's that? So the amygdala... Um, it's an almond shaped structure kind of in the middle of the brain in the temporal lobe. And that is our brain's kind of alert center. It detects anything that's, that's really important for us to respond to. And often that can be a threatening thing. So it's designed to send us into an alert state where we can just very quickly like master a response or provide a response to cope with whatever's there. So for our ancestors, they grew up in the jungle with lions and tigers and, you know, marauding tribes. And so 
it's like the body got a, it got wired in with a response that could just quickly send you into a kind of a fight or flight freeze state in which you can just run away quickly or, or you know, or fight the attacker or freeze so they don't see you. And it's, it's just a very rapid response involving adrenaline and cortisol and a surge of hormones and neurotransmitters designed to energize you um, or to, to, you know, kind of still you so you can deal with whatever's happening. So um, is there a way that we can, you know, look at the stress in our life and, and make some changes? Yeah, that's, um, that's the goal, I think. Um, you know, it's a process of practicing new ways. And in my book, I have a variety of different tools. So one of them is mindfulness, which is kind of, again, learning this attitude to life where you're, you're able to ex- accept what you can't control, where you have more patience, where you find a little bit of distance from, you know, so... so when you're reactive, like the amygdala starts firing, you can kind of begin to breathe and calm it down and slow it down. And um, other tools, for example, might be self-compassion that you learn, you know, to motivate yourself in a healthy way, like to be a good parent or coach to yourself rather than, you know, being perfectionistic and, you know, pushing yourself too hard. And an- another kind of tool might be changing your mindset, like how are you viewing your stress? Are you catastrophizing? Are you viewing it as, as the end of the world? Or, you know, are you kind of micro-focused on it so you can't enjoy anything else in your life? It's trying to learn how to take a broader view and maybe to look at the stress, say, in a different way. Like, you know, what, what, what skills do I need to learn to manage this? What's the potential for growth here? How can I stay involved and committed when things get difficult? So the, and healthy living would be the other tool, you know, the exercise and the sleep. So those are some examples of things you can do to manage stress. So let's go back to the mindfulness. This is something that people talk about a lot and, you know, these days. Um, one thing that I find is, you know, you can say, you know, be mindful, but what does that mean? How do we make that change to actually be aware of ourselves? I think it's actually really hard to do that. So what, what's the first step somebody can do to be mindful that maybe their response is, is causing stress or, or that, or that there is even stress there? So mindfulness, a simple definition is that it's learning to pay attention in a particular kind of a way with a particular kind of an energy. So it's paying attention deliberately in an open, compassionate way to whatever experiences are arising for you, whether those are thoughts or feelings or, you know, things that you see, hear or smell. And so what happens is rather than kind of just being reactive, then, then being your feelings or being caught up in a story about yourself and, you actually can take a step back and and just observe in a compassionate way what's happening with you and learn to get more distance from your judging mind or more distance to clinging to things being a certain way. And one of the first things you can do is just to, to do a simple breathing meditation, which means you can just slow down and watch your breath go all the way in and all the way out, you just, you slow, you watch your breath, you notice where it goes in your nostrils, down the back of your throat, you know, into your chest and belly, and then how it comes up again. And you may just think, I am breathe- as you breathe in, I am breathing in, as you breathe out, I am breathing out. And as, if your mind wanders, you just slowly, gently guide it back to the breath. So the breath is an example of an anchor. You learn to kind of have this the central point of, of calm that you're watching, even though your mind is maybe going all over the place, you learn how to guide it back, to keep guiding it back to its anchor. And so you develop some more control over the focus of attention. And that can actually change your brain over periods of months. So one thing I know, um, a lot of people, when they're starting to make this change, they're not always aware of 
of how those thoughts are are making them feel. So is there something that we can be aware of in our body? Um, you know, maybe something's tightening up or something just so that we know, oh, this is my my stress response so that so that people understand what what's actually happening when they're having that response. Sure. So one kind of a mindful practice would be to notice and describe. So when you feel yourself, you know, being getting worried or when you feel tension arising in your body or you feel kind of a state of anxiety, instead of just getting caught up in, in the whole, you know, dialogue around it and then all the negative predictions and so on, it maybe just notice what's happening. So stop whatever you're doing and just notice that, you know, that there's, there's a change that maybe your body is starting to tense up or, or go into fight or flight. And then just notice specifically where in your body, where in your body is that, are those feelings? Like, is your, are your shoulders, you know, tense? Is there tension in your stomach? Sometimes people with hyperventilate and the, their breathing gets very shallow. So it's just paying attention to what's happening and then uh, breathing, you know, kind of noticing the uncomfortable areas. And then as a next step, perhaps sending breath into those areas and just calmly kind of watching them and noticing if, if you can create a bit more space around that tension or soften a little bit. Okay, well, that definitely makes sense. We're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Melanie Greenberg, and we're discussing her book, The Stress-Proof Brain. We'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-294. 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Melanie Greenberg. We're discussing her book, The Stress-Proof Brain. So, Melanie, before the break, you talked about anxiety. And, and, you know, it's a word that we all know, but it's been quite common for me to have conversations with people who don't even realize how anxious they are. They actually have no idea. They think that they're anxiety-free and everybody else around them suffers from anxiety. So, how can we... you know, recognize that that is going on in in our own body, in our own lives? 
So it starts with slowing down and becoming more self-aware. So it means deliberately directing your energy towards yourself and what's going on in your mind and in your body and in your feelings. And so that may mean, you know, checking in with yourself um, every half hour, every hour, you know, a few hours, and just, just noticing, like, well, what's happening with me now? What's the state of my mind? What's the state of my body? What's the state of the inside of my body? What's the state of my um, feelings? And then just describing what, what's happening, like beginning to notice, well, you might just do a brief kind of scan. Okay, what's, what's going on in my mind? Is it calm or is it, you know, all choppy and turbulent? Is it clear or is it fuzzy? Is it speeded up or is it, is it kind of in a, you know, in a calm, slower pace? And then you might check in with your body. You know, what do my muscles feel like? Check, these are typical areas for tension, might be your neck and shoulders or, you know, the, uh, your, the back of your head or your chest or your belly. You just check in with those areas and see, do they feel tight or do they feel spacious? Do they feel hard or do they feel soft? And then checking in with your feelings, you know, do I feel comfortable or, or pleasant or unpleasant? What, and then what kind of feeling might be arising? And you might give it a word. Is it fear? Is it anger? Is it um, calmness? Is it happiness? Is it contentment? And so on. So, in, and then um, you also spoke about compassion for yourself, which, you know, is something people are saying more and more these days, but is, I think, lacking. So, what, what does that mean, and, and how can we create that? So, I think in today's society, you know, everything's so fast, and we're kind of, we're raised in a more competitive way. It's kind of like, you know, you've got to, you've got to achieve, you've got to conquer, you've got to climb the ladder. And so, you know, we become very focused on pushing ourselves to do more and more and more. And actually, I would say, especially women, uh, you know, often women can get, get guilty or over-responsible, feel like you have to be kind of, you know, the perfect um, wife or mother, um, and then, you know, also maybe a perfect worker. Um, but, you know, this can happen to men as well, just for that, that pressure to provide, to compete and, and so on. And, and roles can be reversed too. It's not necessarily only um, that way. But with all of that, like, we, we learn an attitude that's more kind of like harsh and judgmental, that we, we tend to, you know, think of ourselves as winning or losing and, um, you know, as having, you know, succeeded or having failed. And we develop these categories. And that leads us to become unkind to ourselves, you know, when we perceive ourselves as having failed or messed up or, you know, as not winning. Um, and we may end up criticizing ourselves or, or, you know, kind of being very demanding of ourselves. So what compassion is, it's kind of, it's taking a step back from all of that. And it's trying to find more of a sense of kindness and understanding for yourself. You know, I mean, when do you need your own support? It's when you're, when you're feeling good, it's not necessarily when you need the support, but it's when you're feeling down or when you failed and, you know, not, that's when you often, you know, you need, you need support, you need understanding, you need guidance. And, and many of us didn't get these kind of qualities from our, our parents or our caretakers when we were children. So we don't learn them. But self-compassion is kind of, it's replacing the judgment of yourself and, and the demandingness with, with a more of a kind of a kind, compassionate, understanding way. Well, this is definitely something that I think we lack for ourselves and for the people around us. And, and I think we'd all feel better if we just had a little bit of this overall. I mean, we're so hard on ourselves and we're so hard on, on everyone else, probably a projection of, of how we feel about ourselves. But it just mm-hmm. seems that, you know, we, we don't want 
people to have any room for mistake and error or to be human, which is what we all are, and, and none of us are perfect. Sure, and that's another aspect of self-compassion is the idea of common humanity. So, you know, we're all human, um, and we're only human. Like None of us are finished products. We're all works in progress. And so we don't have to do, be perfect. We don't have to do everything right. You know, it's just normal to make mistakes sometimes. Everybody does it. And in that common humanity, it, 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 it gives you a sense of compassion for yourself, but also compassion for other people. You know, they're human just like you are. They, they mess up just like you do sometimes. You know, they suffer just like you suffer. They have the same aspirations, you know, to be happy and healthy just like you do. And so um, that sense of common humanity can be a way to sort of let go of guilt and perfectionism, but it can also be a, a way to kind of feel more kindness and connection and compassion for others as well as yourself. Yeah, that's definitely important. Um, what, what does being grounded mean? So being grounded means being present, in balance, and connected. I guess you could also use the word emotionally regulated, that, you know, you're in a state of mind where, you know, you're present, you're able to kind of, to listen, to engage, to think clearly, you feel, you know, some sense of balance or calmness. And you can contrast that with being in a kind of a, a fight, flight or freeze state. And so when you're in fight or flight, it's more like, you know, you may not be paying attention because your mind's spinning with all these thoughts or, you know, your breathing may be very fast. And so, you know, you don't, you don't kind of feel connected and grounded. Um, you're in a state of fear or anxiety. Or if you're in a free state, it may be that you, that you're kind of spacing out or zoning out or feeling a kind of a foggy headedness. Um, not really able to kind of enjoy things or feel, you know, not really able to be present in your life. So being grounded, it's, it's the, it's, it's not, it's that state that's neither too freeze and underregulated or too, um, over activated. So, so you're saying um, being emotionally regulated, that was the word you used. Now, I, I think that a lot of people go through life actually thinking that what they're experiencing is okay. So how can we tell whether we have a proper emotional response to something or, you know, if it's airing on the a side that's causing, creating stress? Yeah, so part of it is, is you know, you can check in with the, with your own kind of energy that you have, you know, what's the pace that you're living at? What's the pace of your thoughts? What's the pace of your movements? You know, and are you flitting from, to- from topic to topic in your head? Is it difficult to concentrate? Are you running around in, on kind of automatic pilot? A lot of us run around on automatic pilot, you know, you might don't even really notice w- what you're doing, like, you might, um, you know, drive somewhere and not even notice the stops along the way or something like that. Um, so that's one way is just, is just to check in. Um, yeah, and then another way to, to be grounded is just to kind of to deliberately bring yourself back to the present moment from, from wherever your thoughts are wandering off to. Um, or, you know, if your feelings are kind of spitting you off balance, it's just deliberately kind of saying and let me come back to the present. Let me feel my feet on the ground. Let me feel the connection with the earth. So let me feel my body in the chair. Let me feel that right here, right now. I can just be still and calm, safe. Um, so that can be an exercise also just deliberately bringing yourself back with the present and just connecting with your body in the present moment. So is there ever a time where somebody is doing an exercise like this and they find it um, too difficult to be present, either maybe because the emotions are overwhelming or are they avoiding something that that is suddenly um, they're able to feel or acknowledge when they're doing this? Yeah. So, again, I think people are scared of being present. You know, a lot of people live in 
a state of kind of experiential avoidance. It's like they're trying not to feel their feelings that are underneath because they're too scared of them. But the thing is that when you, when you can be in this kind of regulated state, when you're just noticing your body, breathing slowly, noticing your senses, what's around you, that, you know, being in that state and experiencing emotions, it kind of it naturally kind of calms the emotions down a bit. And um, also, if you can separate your feelings from your judgment, if you can just notice what sadness feels like in your body, as opposed to getting caught up in the whole dialogue and story around it, it can be easier to bear. You know, that makes sense because that is something that we do. We have the story. And and I, I think a lot of people, especially when they're, you know, hurt or angry at someone or something, they they um, want to feel, you know, like they're right about that situation. And uh, that story can come up and get in the way of them working through the emotion. Yeah, very much. I think, you know, sometimes it can you can get into this kind of, you know, I've got to be right and, you know, have, have this whole story of feel like a victim or feel like, you know, you're right and the other person's wrong and, and the other person is, you know, harming you. Um, but, you know, a different way, if you let, just let go of the judgment, if you just try to describe what's ever happening without using a judging word, you can actually, you know, it, it can calm you down a lot. And you can also have more compassion for yourself and the other person. Um, yeah, so that those are that's an example. So when when somebody like say this is their first time um, being mindful and aware, and and say it brings up you know a, a trauma of some kind, and and then they start to get anxious. Um, is there a, a, an exercise or a certain way that they can calm themselves down? something that can help them work through it so that they can continue the practice? Yeah. So, again, I think um, sometimes people who've had traumas, you know, it's more difficult for them to be mindful and present because they can often get kind of, you know, extremes of, of intrusive kind of thoughts and feelings and often at quite a high intensity. And so, you know, you have, to, you have to kind of do what's comfortable for you. And, you know, somebody... If, if that happens, you may also consider maybe seeking some help from a therapist that you know can help you learn to tolerate these states and tolerate the emotions more. Maybe it's easier for you to tolerate your feelings in the presence of a supportive person, for example. Um, but just the way we can soothe ourselves, um, if it's not at that extreme, is just we soothe through our senses. So when we go to our senses, like whatever we see, noticing whatever we're seeing or hearing or feeling or smelling, we get into a part of our brain that's kind of separate from the from all the worrying network, and it's naturally kind of soothing. So one way to just to get back to being present is just to notice three things in the room and describe them. That can kind of you know that can take your mind back to the present and, and out of that, that panicky kind of state or just to notice your feet on the ground and maybe, you know, maybe stamp your left and your right foot and just feel that connection. Um, you could also think of yourself as, imagine yourself as a big tree, a big oak tree or something with, you know, with roots going way into the ground. You know, just feel the strength of, of that tree image um, and how your branches might sway in the wind of the emotion, but you're not going to be bowled over because, you know, you have the solid trunk. So imagery can be helpful as well. I, I like the idea of, of, you know, describing three things in the room, um, you know, especially if you, even if you're alone doing that out loud, I can see where that could just get, you know, if you're saying it out loud, it would take your thoughts away, whatever, wherever you're going. And it would, uh, you know, ground you and make you aware of, of where you are and, and, and what's going on in, in the room in that present moment. Yeah, a lot of times our minds are in the past, you know, either maybe regretting the past or, you know, having bad memories or, or, you know, memories that we're still kind of struggling with. Or our mind might be in the future, you know, anticipating what what might go wrong. Um, 
And so bringing your mind just to the very, the present moment, you know, and noticing that you're just here and you're in the room and nothing bad is happening now to you, even though, you know, your mind and body may be giving you signals that, that something is wrong. It, it's, it's a very good practice to help you, um, you know, be able um, less in a state of, of chronic stress all the time. Well, and, and like you said, we're um, usually either living, we're living in the past or often in the future, especially with anxiety, we're worrying about what's going to happen, <clears throat> or we're regretting something that did happen. And uh, we're forgetting about where we are. And we're not, we're not enjoying this time, we're just continually going back and forth between past and present and, and forgetting what's actually happening and, and living in this moment. Exactly. And, and so changing that your time frame of what you look at, um, it's, it's a way of regulating emotion as well, I think. Yeah, I, I, I can see that because if you're, you know, anxious about what's going to happen tomorrow or in an hour and then instead bring yourself into this moment, you know, it's going to go slower, it's going to go easier and you're going to have a, you know, a better time with with what's going to come up because I, I you know they they always say that that worrying is more energy than actually dealing with the crisis when it does happen if it does happen at all exactly and I think about 80 percent of what we worry about never happens um, that's a lot a lot of energy we could probably you know <laughs> get a, you know power a city with with all the worrying that everybody's doing Exactly, exactly. It's almost it's an automatic wiring in a way. Our brains are wired to predict the future, you know, and execute a response because the main function of our brain is survival. It's like to keep you alive. Uh, but the problem is that it's kind of, it gets overactive and oversensitive, kind of like a smoke alarm that's always going off or something. Mm. Uh, We're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Melanie Greenberg, and we're discussing her book, The Stress-Proof Brain. So we'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has launched our mobile app for iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry. Visit the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host, no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of return to peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN or follow along with us at Voice America TRN. The Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, 
everybody. Welcome back. Today we're talking with Melanie Greenberg and we're discussing her book, The Stress-Proof Brain. So Melanie, I know we're, we're talking about being aware of, of emotions and stress, um, but I know there's a lot of people that, you know, when I talk to them about this or, you know, they start being aware, they think that they can't change. You know, they say they're too old or this is the way they're wired or, you know, their mom was like this. Is it, mm-hmm. it, it, is it possible for us to actually change this? No, it it is. And this is something that's come out of neuroscience research, um, probably in the last 20 years or so. You know, before that, we used to think that, you know, once you got to adulthood, um, that the brain was fixed and couldn't be changed, you know, after about the age of 25. And now we know that, that that's not true, that even adult brains can change. It's not easy and it's not quick. Um, It takes repeated practice. Uh, It's like you have to build new roads in your brain, um, new new connections. Our brain is consists of billions of neurons and they're all firing all the time and they're all connecting with thousands of other neurons. And there's this just incredibly intricate and complex network. Um, But when you have a a particular thought or when you do a a behavior, um, or you, you keep going into a, the same situation, the neurons in your brain will start, you know, connecting up and, and kind of, uh, be, kind of be, that gets more entrenched into your brain. So if you have, you know, if you have a depressive way of thinking, if you're always seeing things pessimistically, you probably have neurons in your brain that are, you know, automatically when you're going to, to the most negative possibility. And you can, um, through lots of practice over months and for sometimes some people years, you can rewire it. You can, you know, change the strength of that connection by every time your brain goes to that negative thought to, to kind of, you know, to not, not allowing yourself to stay there, to redirecting, whether that's, you know, distracting yourself or redirecting your perspective to try to get, you know, think of a more hopeful way to see the situation, um, and if you redirect and redirect and redirect, eventually you'll grow new neuro, neuro, neuronal connections. And those will be, will, you know, start firing more and more and become more intensely connected. So that can become your natural way, which is really well, exciting. It's really it, exciting that we can change our brains in this way. Well, it, it is. And, you know, it, it's... Uh, it, you know, the old way of thinking that this is the way we are and we're going to be like this our whole lives. So if we have high anxiety or depression or a certain way of seeing things that we don't like, we feel, you know, a lot of people feel trapped in that. And to know that we can change this. I mean, it's not easy. It is like, like you said, building roads, which is also not easy. We all know what construction is like, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's stressful and hard and it slows things down for a little bit, I guess. But but, uh, exactly. you know, you know, it's uh, eventually then we've got this nice pathway and this, you know, that that we can reach our goal of, of maintaining what we want. Exactly. Like these are metaphor I use for my patients. I kind of think, you know, when they sort of say, well, you know, this is I, I keep thinking of myself as, you know, as being bad or ugly or whatever it is. And at the end. You know, I, even though I want to change that thought, I can't change that thought. And then I might use the metaphor of saying, well, you know, of course you can't change that thought right away because you've got a super highway in your brain that's, you know, that's just going there. But you can, you can start digging the ditch to, you know, to build a new road of, of self-appreciation. But, you know, have patience with it. Just keep doing it. Just stick with it. Um, sometimes people give up too soon, I think, because they lose hope. Well, you know, I, I I did a show once that the uh, where he talked about the negative um, thoughts are actually quite addictive, so I, I, it seems like that uh-huh. is also important to acknowledge that you know we're we're. And, and, and who hasn't experienced this? I mean, just thinking about gossip, right? It's very addictive. And I know in my, my younger life, I used to go looking for the gossip because it it, <laughs> it it was so addictive. And then when you realize, you know, it's hurtful and that kind of thing, it's something that, that you have to change. But I think just like any other addiction, we have to acknowledge that we're, we're stuck in this pattern because it's so comfortable and so addictive. And we have to want to change it and acknowledge that 
Yeah, exactly. And again, I think it's, it's related to the brain's wiring for survival. Um, so, you know, for our ancestors, probably gossip helped people survive. It was useful because it, it gave you information about other people and what to expect from them, you know, and that kind of thing, who you could rely on, um, who would be the best person to befriend, you know, in your tribe and things like that, how you could stop yourself from getting kicked out of the tribe. Um, but today, you know, it's lost that function, but somehow brains are still, you know, wired to do that and also wired to the negative. Because again, for our ancestors, if you, um, you know, they're walking along and you see a rustling in the bush, it's better to, you know, make a hundred thousand times the mistake of thinking, um, thinking it's a tiger when it's a leaf versus, you know, just one time thinking it's a leaf when it's a tiger. So, uh, you know, the negative, going to the negative enhances, enhanced as an ancestor survival. So our brains are just wired that way. And that's, but you have to kind of train it with new habits. So um, when we're working on training that perspective, um, aside from the mindfulness, is there something else that we should bring in so that we can change those negative thoughts like I'm ugly into something more positive? Yeah. So, you know, I, there's um, something called taking in the good, uh, which is it's actually um, from Rick Hansen, who is the author of a book called Buddha's Brain. And taking in the good, it's a bit, it's related to mindfulness, but it's not exactly the same. So mindfulness is noticing whatever's there, whatever naturally arises, um, your thoughts, feelings, and so on, or whatever's around you, but taking the judgment out of it, trying to see it in an open, accepting, compassionate, calm way. Um, taking in the good is more about uh, changing your perception, changing what you focus on so that you pay more attention to, you know, the good aspects, the positive aspects of life. So an example might be, you know, writing a gratitude diary. So, you know, at the end of the day, you write down about three things um, that day that you're grateful for in your life or, you know, expressing appreciation to your partner or your family or your friend. Um, you know, go, when you savoring, like when you're walking along, maybe just noticing some simple thing like a flower and just really focusing on it, like deepening the experience, breathing it in, you know, absorbing the, the beautiful color of the flower. Um, so, again, it's, it's sort of it's compensates for the brain's, uh, brain's natural focus on worrying and the negative and um judgment by by deliberately training your brain to be focused on the, all the good things you know in, in your ex, your day-to-day -day experience of life and it can really make you happier over time well you know um i was when i was at my sickest i had a doctor ask me to write down all my symptoms every day and uh it, he didn't understand when i got upset about it because i didn't want to uh -huh. write the negative things down there's actually exactly. studies uh -huh. showing you know that that reinforces uh -huh. right and uh so anytime i have somebody coming in who does that i tell them they have to complement it with positive things of how they felt so that they can also see the other side of it you know today i had five minutes of feeling good even if it's that small because otherwise you know when we focus on the negative parts of how we feel it seems like we're reinforcing that part instead of sure. as you say doing the gratitude part where we're aware of the flower or the you know the small things that brought us joy yeah, exactly, and um, I think that's right. You, it, you, it's more, it just naturally goes to the negative and like sticks there. So you have to do, do work every single day, if it, uh, practice and practice and practice um, to change that. But over time, it can have huge rewards. I also do that with my patients. So, for example, if I had somebody who was trying to give up marijuana, and you know they would sort of they would write down every time they used and so on. And, and that got very negative. So now what I do is have them write down when they use, but then on the other side, write down or any of the healthy things they did for themselves that day, you know, like go to a yoga class or something like that. Um, or, or take, you know, take a rest and go to bed early. 
And so when they have their, their diary, it's not only of the negative. It's about the other things that they did, because otherwise it just would show their their failure of, oh, I gave in that day and this and that instead of, but I did these five things for myself that week that I didn't do before and I'm choosing these other things. You have to see, um, you know, those positive things as well. Otherwise, we're not making those new road roadways where we're still stuck in that old free, negative freeway. Exactly. And also, you know, just focusing on, in this particular instance, just focusing on the, on the failures can be shaming. You know, you just feel mm-hmm. terrible about yourself. Um, or just, you know, just focusing on the symptoms can make you feel very helpless or, you know, or very overwhelmed. And so, you know, it's creating that different mindset where you can let a little bit of sunshine in. You know, you're finding that ray of hope or that, you know, the, the hope that you could change or hope that, you know, that you can learn to live better with your symptoms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the, that shame, I find a big thing. I, I know w- women are good at this. I'm sure men are as well. We're, you know, we're trying to change ourselves and we don't, so we get mad at ourselves. <laughs> Right. Whether yeah. it's changing, you know, giving up a food or giving up a thought to them, we're like, oh, God, I gave in today. I had some chocolate. And then we're all mad at ourselves. And then which is worse for us than than the giving in part, you know, that little piece that we had or or whatever we've done. And we create this negative train of thought that goes on probably for all day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The inner, your inner critics kind of feeding you up. Yeah. Um, for, for being human, basically. And so, like, if, a, a way out of self-compassion, a way to deal with that is um, you might acknowledge that, you know, that maybe there's different parts of you that have different needs. So there may be a part that actually, you know, wants to eat the cookies because it feels like it needs comfort, even mm-hmm. though it's not healthy for you. And then there may be another part that, you know, that knows it's not good and, and wants to be healthier and wants to learn to live without it. And so, you know, understanding that those two parts are there in you, so you can't just like eradicate the part that Mm -hmm. wants the cookie, but you have to maybe kind of dialogue with it. Yeah, that's Uh, a good way to put it is acknowledging both, both parts and the need for whatever's happening as well. Yeah, so another way with, of being self-compassionate is just to see things in, your, in terms of unmet needs rather than in ter- that drove your behavior rather than thinking of yourself as bad or weak. Yeah. Now, um, we're going to have to finish the show. This has been a, a great conversation. Is there any way that people can find your book or get a hold of you if they have more questions? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I'd love for people to, to contact me or to look at more of my work. Um, so my book, The Stress-Proof Brain, it's on Amazon or Barnes & Noble, or, you know, my major booksellers. Um, uh, or you could also go to my website, which is d- Dr. Dr. Melanie Greenberg.com, And there you'll find links to my book as well as links to my newsletter and a lot of blog posts and articles around these issues. And I also write a blog for psychology today. It's called The Mindful Self-Express. Mindful and then the self dash express. And this, this has a, a range of um, articles on topics ranging from mindfulness, self compassion, the brain, stress, and, and relationships and everything in between. Okay, perfect. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. This was a great show. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. And uh, um, for anybody listening, uh, we did mention Rick Hansen. He was actually on the show um, maybe about a year ago. If you want to find that show, you can find it um, easily filtered uh, on my blog site, which is dr-risk.com. And I want to thank you so much for listening today. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. 